Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to the Royal Society of Medicine and our In Conversation series. And I'm absolutely delighted to say that our guest today is Lord Sumption, Jonathan Sumption, uh, the Supreme Court judge, and many, many other things beside. Now, how can we introduce Jonathan? When, when, when they make a film about your life, Jonathan, it's going to be very hard to find a scriptwriter who can even do justice to the scale of your story. Well, thank uh, those, God for that. Yes, I'm sure we will find one. And also, I can't think who would play you, actually. I think Ian McKellen, actually, I was wondering about. But anyway, for those unfamiliar with it, I'll just simply summarise. You started with the first in history at Magdalen. You jumped straight into a fellowship at your college without even needing a PhD, something pretty unheard of in the academic world. You established yourself as a medieval historian with books on the medieval pilgrimage, the Albigensian Crusade. You were clearly heading to be the chair of medieval history. But you left academic history. Well, actually, actually, you didn't leave history at all, but you left academia, as we know, and you went to the bar. You established yourself as a leading silk, whose collection of cases would be more than sufficient for several feature films. But not content with that, you then jumped from being a top QC straight to the top, literally the top, of the judicial ladder on the Supreme Court. And, and then, um, in retirement, you cemented your reputation as a public thinker by delivering one of the highest intellectual accolades we have in in this country, the Reef Lectures. But true to form, none of that is where we're going to start. If um, medieval chroniclers were to write the history of 220, there can be no doubt it would start, this was the beginning of the fearful plague. Now it's not a plague, as we'll discuss later, but it certainly is fearful. And it's fair to say that with your characteristic clarity and indeed courage, you're not a great fan of the way we are managing it. So let's start off with your concerns um, with the way in which has been, the government has been managing the current crisis or more particularly managing us. Well, I think it's done some things right. Uh, it has spectacularly increased the ICU capacity of the National Health Service in a very short time, uh, which has probably contributed more to, uh, to solving or helping to solve the problem than anything else. I also think it's very unfair to criticize them for the simple fact that more people have died in this country uh, than in other European countries because the determinants of death are very numerous and government policy is only one of them, I suspect a relatively minor one. Things like the underlying state of health, obesity, cardiovascular disease seem much more likely to explain differences we have a pretty lousy underlying state of health in this country. That's a problem. But what I've got against the lockdown uh, is basically that although I am not a believer in the idea that liberty is an absolute value, I do believe that it's a value of very great importance and that a strong case is required in order to infringe it. Uh, I have always felt that the case made for a lockdown was extremely weak. The first reason for that is simply that I have approached this initially as a historian. Humanity has always lived with epidemics. Um, most of them have much worse case mortality rates than this one. Uh, bubonic plague, cholera, TB, uh, meningitis, more recently MERS and SARS. Uh, these things have been much more mortal than COVID-19. The COVID-19 deaths worldwide now stand at a bit less than 600,000. That's less than half uh, the annual death toll uh, from TB. There is nothing special about this particular epidemic, except for one thing, which is that Europe and North America, the West, has dodged all previous bullets of this sort for a long time, but has been hit by this one. And long decades of relative immunity from epidemic diseases in the West uh, has lost for us the ability uh, to tolerate risks which our ancestors took for granted and were perfectly capable of coping with. This is likely to continue in the future. Major pandemics have been top of the UK risk register ever since it started in 2008. We are going to have to learn to live with pandemics uh, and to combine them with our ordinary life rather than running away. The second point I would make is that lockdowns do not suppress epidemics. They only push it into 
a future period when the lockdown is lifted. Now that is not my judgment, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I think that citizens ought to try to understand this. And what I've just said is the judgment of the government's own scientific advisors. It was the view suggested by, given by SAGE in February, and it was the essential point made in the famous Imperial College model on the 16th of March. Their view was that a lockdown would have to be kept in place for that reason until a vaccine was available, possibly uh, for 18 months or more. It's not even clear now that a vaccine will ever be permanently effective. And as they pointed out, that would have phenomenal social and economic costs. There was a so coherent case for a lockdown, not one that I would accept, but one which I recognize has a good deal of force at a stage when the NHS was completely unable to cope. There was a case for delaying the peak until the ICU capacity caught up. But it did catch up surprisingly quickly, probably in fact, looking at it in hindsight, by the middle of April. The peak was on the 11th of April, and at that stage, 40% of the ICU capacity was being used. The Nightingale hospitals, the private hospitals requisitioned by the government, have all been standing empty for most of the time. Um, the third factor is that the collateral effects of a lockdown are really very serious. This isn't just a public health issue. It's a political issue. It involves weighing the public health factors against other considerations. The education of our children, the prosperity uh, of our society, on which, after all, we depend for our ability to combat uh, any kind of epidemic diseases, and other effects on health. Effects, for example, on mental health, on, on, on cancer deaths, um, there is more to life than the avoidance of death, and if the cost of being alive is to suppress everything that is worth it, then my view is that the cost is simply too high. Finally, I think law is a very inefficient way of dealing with a problem like this, because it's a one-size-fits-all solution. The risks associated with COVID-19 are very variable. If you were about to do something that might expose you to infection, there are a lot of questions you might ask. How old am I? What's my state of health? Have I had it already? How important is what I'm proposing to do to me, to other people? How much contact with other people will be involved? For how long? The problem about law is it only has one answer to these questions. The only efficient way to deal with this is to allow people to make their own risk assessments, and that involves making it voluntary and relying on the, the, their own common sense to make the, these kind of judgments. Now, I think that for a government to treat people as if they were too stupid, selfish, uh, or self-indulgent to act in their own interest uh, is both patronizing and uh, in, intolerable in a democratic society. It's also factually wrong, as I think we have learned. Okay, now, all, I mean, all of that is well said and well put. And, um, and in fact, the reason that I contacted you to ask would you agree to this interview was your right, I think in the Sunday Times, when you said your conclusion was, um, it's not for a minister to tell grandparents whether or not they should hug their grandchildren. And I uttered a little cheer at that and said, at last someone has said something that I thoroughly agree with. But it is my constitutional task, as it were, to put to you one or two of the opposing views, and they definitely are opposing views, as of course you know, and um, in so doing, I have to admit, using another historical analogy, I do feel a bit like a soldier in the trenches in the First World War. I'm about to attack a fortified German machine gun post. I know I have to do it, but I also know it's most likely to end very badly for me. But nevertheless, that's what we've got to do here. And let me just start with the first thing. You you slipped in the idea that, that you know, that, that, um, that, that this had been, that you use the word law and that the government has forced you to do something that you do not want to do, um, in, in other words, to remain in a lockdown. That but you may not want to do. You, you may, may not want to do. To, you may be wise to lock yourself down. It's right. a judgment but, people make. But in, in your instance, you don't want to do that. I think you've made that perfectly clear. And, and, and you feel that, the, that this has been coerced on you. But, you know, the, the facts are that actually, although the government has those powers in this country and not, not in others, in this country, they've barely been used, haven't they? This has been one of the most remarkable voluntary actions this society has ever taken. 
Oh, well, if by voluntary you mean people have voluntarily complied when they could have yes. got away without complying, um, I agree with you, but that is a reason why it would have been sensible at the outset to allow people to make their own judgments and not to impose judgments on them. Well, but people, but, but nevertheless, to, to the, the, it isn't as if this has been forced, in a sense it has been, uh, the, the government has gone along, or, and indeed, we know that people were starting to do this before the government, uh, Boris spoke, and continued to do with it after. So it's not, I think to use the word coercion, we, we've been some examples of police forces behaving uh, in a very high-handed way, as you pointed out very early on, I think. But that's not been the general experience that people have. It's Look, not the main you... motive for why that they have complied with the lockdown. Well, I, I entirely agree with that, but I don't regard it as an argument against my views uh, on lockdown. Um, the, the government could have achieved much the same results um, without bringing law into it. Now, you say people haven't been coerced. They haven't been coerced because they have complied and because they, in a lot of cases, though not in, by any means in all, would have complied anyway. But law is inherently coercive. If you say to people, you will get a £130 fine if people catch you um, outside otherwise than for one of the purposes uh, specifically allowed by ministers, that is coercion. Um, and you have to test the question whether something is coercive by asking what happens when people decide that they're not going to comply. Now, uh, there are perfectly sound reasons why you might decide uh, that you're not going to comply. For example, uh, you might already have, the disease, have had the disease you might conclude, as Professor Ferguson did, that for that reason, there was absolutely no reason <laughs> why he shouldn't mix with other people. Um, there are a number of other things that you could, have you could have decided that although it was on the whole desirable that you should stay indoors, there were imperative reasons why you should not. Uh, that was what Dominic Cummings got a lot of uh, obloquy for doing. Um, now, all of these are cases where people have made their own judgments have done no harm to anyone at all. Uh, and nevertheless, the government has introduced regulations that provide in many of these cases, not in all of them, uh, for fines. Now, that, that to my mind is coercive. Well, you, you said in The Spectator that undoubtedly there will be a few people who don't make sensible decisions uh, yeah. But you can't imprison the whole population simply because a small minority are not being very sensible with regards to their safety or the yes. safety of others. So th those are that, I'm, I'm quoting you there. But of course, we do do that, don't we? We have the seatbelt example. Yes. Well, you know, we, we coerce people to do that because a small number of people refuse. Most yes. of us would do it. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I mean, the seatbelt example is in a sense analogous because not doing it can cause you to crash into somebody else and kill or damage them. But I began uh, this interview by pointing out that I did not believe that liberty was an absolute value. Uh, it, but it is, uh, to my mind, a very weighty value. Now, the point about seatbelts, you could say the same about face masks and quite a lot of other things, is that yeah. the collateral social costs of wearing a seat mask or a face, uh, sorry, a seat belt or a face mask uh, are piffling so that the, the counter arguments are not very strong. The thing about a lockdown is it is hugely destructive, as indeed um, the sage admitted that it would be. Um, it is destructive economically, it's destructive educationally, it's destructive mentally and socially. Uh, now, that to my mind is a, a, a sufficiently strong reason for not doing it. You try and analyze seat belts, or face masks in the same way, it is a very minor infringement of liberty for an obvious public benefit with no downside. Uh, all that you can really say in the way of downsides about seatbelts is it may, some people may regard it as a bit of a bore to wear them. But a bit of a bore is one thing. The destruction of our children's educational future and of our economy is something quite different. Okay. Well, let me take that phrase you just used to crash into someone else, okay? Um, mm -hmm. You could by not wearing a seatbelt, and, and let's just pursue that analogy a bit. It's the it's the crashing into someone else. It, the fact being that the the one of the purposes of a lockdown is to prevent you from crashing into someone else uh, 
um, and thereby, thereby endangering their health and safety. Yes, but they've got a remedy for that. They can voluntarily do what the government has been compelling them to do. Um, if you feel, I mean, if you, if you, like me, do not feel particularly vulnerable, I may be right or wrong, mm -hmm. um, you're perfectly prepared to go and take the risk of being with other people who might infect you, and they will presumably be prepared to take the same risk uh, that you might infect them. Um, if you do not wish to take that risk, you can do voluntarily what the government says you must do. Um, so I don't think there's any social gain out of a lockdown. And one always goes back to the fact that if we are going to have to live with COVID-19 anyway, because mm -hmm. epidemics don't go away, they just sit there waiting for you to come outdoors again. If, if that's the case, and it seems to be, then uh, uh, the sooner we get used to the idea of living with COVID-19, the better, because we cannot shield ourselves. We can't run away from this forever. Um, the only difference it makes to delay matters now that the NHS has caught up uh, is the untold uh, psychological, economic and educational damage that is being done in the meantime. Sooner or later we have to get, rid of, get used to this and sooner is obviously more sensible than later. I, mean, I agree with those sentiments. It's, it is, well as they, who is it, Dumas said about treason, it is also a question of timing. Um, and I want to continue with that analogy. Context was a bit different in his case. Yes, true. But let, let's. But the, I think though, you, I think there's one point that you, you, your, your critics say that you haven't considered. And let's go back. Let's go back to um, rather earlier than I expected. But let, let's go to the Great Plague then. And mm. and I want to to use one example. You know, in your favourite subject, the Middle Ages, the calamitous 14th century. Um, I was. Uh, given Barbara Tuckman's book when I was a student, mm -hmm. actually. I thought it was brilliant. I hope you, I hope you think it was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but in the Calamitous 14th century, um, we have the Black Death. And, and, but I want to take you in, in, char, in, in, in um, uh, Britain, Trial by Battle here, but that's completely wrong. It is, yes, you're, the first volume mm -hmm. uh, of your magisterial history. You, you quote Simon of Cuba. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, and, and can I, I'll, I'll give you the quote that you use from him because it's, he's, a, as you know, a doctor and theologian writing in Paris in, in 1350, or perhaps mm -hmm. Montpellier, but we don't know. But this is what he said. He said, the plague was a great respecter of princes, knights, and judges. So you, you, you quote him for that. And uh, we'll come back to that later, but I want to use that now um, because pretty much that's still the case, isn't it? it is um, still only to some extent. Uh, it depends on what the disease is. Uh, if you look at the plague in the 14th century, the big outbreak in 1348 was certainly a respecter uh, of uh, princes, knights, and judges. The main yeah. reason for that is likely to be that they were better fed. They had a... Yes. Fed, that wasn't always the case. And they were, also, they were generally fitter. Yes. Um, uh, if you compare... But, but, I mean, it doesn't always work out that way, because if you look at the outbreak that happened 30 years later, uh, it attacked precisely the fittest sort of people and much younger people. We have a good modern parallel to that in the comparison between COVID-19 and Spanish flu, which was endemic in this country from yep. 1918 to about 1921 or two. Um, uh, COVID-19 famously attacks those who have serious underlying conditions, specific, particularly if they're old. Um, uh, Spanish flu primarily attacked healthy people in the 25 to 40 range. Um, and so, you know, these things, the, the epidemiology is very different. Well, it's different, but it's still the case that if you have more comorbidities or you have less comorbidities, as you would be if you were a knight, a prince or a judge, you're better off. And it's certainly the case that if you look at those who die, age is a massive factor, but it's not the only factor. Okay. The most risky occupation is a security guard um, or a taxi driver or a shop assistant. And, and the point being, or, or, and of course, someone from an ethnic minority. And the point being, Jonathan, you know, we, you know, that, that um, we, you, when you were talking, you were talking about you, you're a judge and actually, bizarrely, I'm a knight. 
we are both less likely to be taken by COVID than the, those uh, less fortunate to us, whether it's two, 2020 and 1350. And, and that surely does make a difference, does it not? Because uh, it makes some difference, but not as much difference as I think you are claiming. Um, it's always the case that people whose underlying health are better, is better will survive an epidemic better, they have yes. better chances of surviving an epidemic than other people. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, it, it happens to be the case, though it isn't always so, that um, the poorest are often those who take least care of, of their underlying health conditions. Now, um, I, I accept all of that, but I think you've also got to remember that the people who are most damaged by the lockdown uh, are not knights, judges, uh, and princes. They tend to be the poorest. Uh, to me, the lockdown was not a very great inconvenience. I live in a nice spacious house yeah. in a large garden, and it wasn't a problem personally. Um, I mean, I would, I missed the, the, the social mixing and so on, but that's, you know, a much relatively minor consideration. The reason why I feel so strongly about it is it precisely hits the people with insecure jobs, jobs that are now disappearing at a rapid rate. It precisely hits people who have cramped accommodation, who are living uh, in a small flat with several children screaming, uh, with a wife that they either hate or shortly will. Um, you know, I think you've got to look at both sides of this. You, you, yes. you, you are, you're avoiding one issue though. You are a little bit that um, you and I, you, you, your concept is that we have the ability to make choices, uh, including risky ones. But the people mm -hmm. that you're describing have a much less ability to do that than you do. They may not have the choice about not working in a risky job that exposes them to people who have made the choice to take the risk. But they have to work as taxi that's drivers. That's irrelevant to the lockdown. We would have the, that problem. The lockdown protects them. No, it doesn't. Um, the, we would, it, let's suppose there were no lockdown. They would still have the problem uh, that they might be working in a job where they were more likely to be infected. Now, the they'd lockdown, have to get infected from someone, Jonathan. You know, yes. It's not visited by God. No, we don't believe that's that. That's anyway. absolutely right. But we would have the problem of people not wanting to work in places where they might be exposed to contact with other human beings, and whether we had the lockdown or not. Now, you will recall that the regulations that were originally issued actually had an exception for people who needed to go to work because they did the kind of work that couldn't be done remotely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they had this problem anyway. Okay, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite convinced by that because I think I'm totally with you if we were all making the same autonomous choice as risk. And if my choice to go to a restaurant was the same choice that people had in working with the restaurant and so on, and I don't think that they do. Uh, and well, I think that that time will come. I think it has to come. I'm not sure you're right about that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, a, a, uh, as a matter of law, uh, an employer has an obligation uh, to provide uh, a, a safe place of work, but safety is a matter of judgment ultimately for a tribunal. And um, uh, I suspect that no tribunal is going to say you're entitled to an entirely uh, risk-free environment. True. Um, uh, and I, I, but basically, if you can show that the risk is substantial, you won't be committing a breach of your employment terms uh, by not turning up to work. Um, but I think that there are an awful lot of people who uh, are overstating the risks to themselves. I think you've also got to bear in mind that there are rights which quite properly exist, but there are also duties. Um, public servants, for example, have a duty uh, to serve the public, and that may involve taking risks. The teachers union, for example, uh, has been very difficult about the idea of reopening schools. Now, uh, what would we say uh, if uh, people who worked in the NHS said, well, it's risky working in the NHS. We expect to be paid our salary, but without actually turning up and doing it. Uh, I suspect that we would say, well, uh, you know, that this, is, this is your job. Your duty is to do that. And the same applies to teachers, as I think the great majority of teachers actually recognize, because I don't get the impression 
uh, that the line taken by the teachers union is actually one that is shared by a great proportion of their members. Well, I don't know. Um, my daughter-in-law is a teacher, and I think she would dispute that. Polling, it doesn't... polling suggests that, that, in practice, teachers are not quite as paranoid as their union. Okay. And then, then let me then let me also what, 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 one, one other point, which I, I think is, is, is an interesting one, particularly for you as well, is your, your general thesis is the state is overplaying its hand, that, that it's... Uh, using coercion or whatever it's using its powers inappropriately but again let's let's just have a look at that in in a little bit more detail and i, I want to take you to trials of a state of the state now the, the book you wrote mm -hmm. around your leaf yeah. and um and in it you use an example of when the state used its resources backed by an electorate and you the quote was for the benign purpose of improving the lot of humanity and you're referring to the 1945 labor government and, and you i think you're making the point that, that, that um, states can, uh, you know, where they have the support of the electorate and where they have good purpose, et cetera, um, they, they can uh, exert the powers that they have. Now, is that not the same here? We have a state mobilizing its resources, not using very much coercion, we've agreed, nothing like on the scale of the war, and for the benign purpose of improving the lot of humanity, which would be trying to avoid the loss of tens of thousands of people. And there's no question, supported by the overwhelming majority of the electorate, whether judged by their representatives in Parliament or by opinion polls. It's the ending of the lockdown that's proving unpopular, not the lockdown. So by what criteria then do you have to say that they are overplaying their hand and went beyond um, what their democratic powers might be? Well, I don't think uh, that their purpose is benign. I quite agree that uh, public health in, uh, is, is a benign purpose, but as I've sought to point out, uh, the collateral costs are extremely high. Uh, and uh, one of the problems is that the government has uh, not actually weighed up pros and cons. They have simply said, this is a potential public health disaster. They haven't asked themselves the only question that matters until quite recently, namely, is it worth it? There's no indication that they asked themselves uh, that question until very late in the day. The prime minister is reputed to have said when he was told about the scale of unemployment, uh, destruction of our gross domestic product and so on in the early June, gripes. Well now, uh, what on earth did you think was going to happen? And the answer is he doesn't seem to have thought about it at all, at least not so far as the public record shows. So I don't accept that this is a, a, a benign question. I think that there are uh, pluses and minuses and that the minuses uh, greatly uh, out, out, outweigh the pluses. Well, um, let me put you on the spot but, then. I mean, on the, on, the, on the public opinion point, mm. uh, you are quite right that at the outset there was overwhelming public support for it. Mm -hmm. Public support is probably still a majority, but it's a good deal smaller majority uh, than it was. Um, I think that my point would be is not so much, not just a criticism of the government, uh, it's also a criticism of my fellow citizens. <laughs> because the, the, the problem really is uh, that uh, governments with popular support can do very, very oppressive things, and some of them are, are very wicked things. I'm not necessarily describing this in that way, but, but uh, uh, the danger uh, with despots is precisely that they appeal uh, to uh, public opinion to do things which, in the cold light of day and by any objective standard, look absolutely appalling. Now, uh, I don't think, therefore, that the mere fact that the public is in favour of it uh, is a good enough reason. But you're, you're quite right to say, and it's really the implication of this, that if I'm criticising the government, I ought to be criticising my fellow citizens for supporting the government, and I do. But I will actually say this as well, which is that the government has to a large extent created its own public opinion by what I regard as an extremely exaggerated PR process. This is Boris Johnson's project fear. Uh, and <laughs> what he has sought to do is to achieve compliance by encouraging fear for the first six to eight weeks of this crisis. Uh, and by doing, I mean, fear is infectious, just like epidemics. 
Yes. Uh, and by, by doing that, uh, he has achieved a high degree of compliance, but he's now learning the cost of that. And he's now trying to say, well, let's all go back to work. And people are naturally asking themselves, well, I thought you said this was the most terrible disaster in waiting that there ever was. Uh, what's changed? The honest answer to that question would be nothing's changed. It just wasn't true in the first place. Um, uh, but of course, governments, except for the Norwegian governments, are never, often, they're never very rarely honest enough uh, to say that. Well, yeah, they're true. But well, let me let me then ask you this: that um, I, from I, from the work I did on the Mental Health Act and a little bit about Mental Health Act law, a little bit. Um, and I know that we advise that uh, the criteria for detention in the front of the new act should be that it should be proportionate involving the least possible restriction of liberty in the shortest amount of time, which I think is completely uncontroversial. Yes. But let's just say now you are hearing a judicial review against the current government policies. Would you then, do you think a judge, you or any other, would then uh, say um, that the current situation would indeed mean that you could judicially reverse a, a decision of, of the government? Well, in any judicial review of that kind, there would be two basic issues. One is, do they have the power to do this at all? Because if they don't, it doesn't matter how proportionate, how necessary, yep. how desirable it is. Okay, that's a pure question of law. I've got no problem about a court deciding that. I would be very surprised if a court were to decide that it was disproportionate because uh, any technical, any question, and particularly a technical question, requires you to decide who is in the best position to form a judgment about this. There are some issues which the courts are happy to make their own judgment about. In my view, they should be a good deal less happy, a good deal less often than they actually are. But I think that if this were ever to come before a court, and it may well do, the courts would be likely to decide that on an issue like this, on which experts disagree and on which a judgment has been made, the government had to be allowed to do its own thing, subject only to political responsibility and not to uh, be answerable for the courts. That's what I think they should say, and I'm pretty Thank confident that it's what they would say. Would say. So, I mean, that you, you've got to... There's a, one is the question, one question is, is it disproportionate? The other is, who's to decide? What degree of deference do you pay to the executive? And I think this would be decided on the second of those grounds. Okay. And, and of course, that, that does lead to a, a certain irony, which I'm sure you, you will relish as well, is that your opposition to this then is, um, is political, not legal. And oh, yes, course, absolutely it is. So you're breaking your own injunction that, that well, and, unless... I'm not a judge, and I'm not speaking judicially. <laughs> okay. Okay, that, I mean, that's a good point, isn't it? I mean... Um, I'm a citizen now. Yeah, and therefore, so you, you are now arguing on, on a political point politically. Not Absolutely, a, I am. I've got no bones about that at all. And, and I and think... that's why can... I wouldn't be saying any of this, and I wouldn't be talking to you now if I was still a judge. And, and of course that, that's, but, but I'm just going to challenge you slightly on that because even when you were a judge, a very senior judge, um, a couple of years ago, you were doing the Oxford lectures um, and I think you were kind of slightly rehearsing what would become the wreath lectures. And in the book, I, I, there's a book written by you and also including um, the uh, people who spoke uh, on, on contrary views in which you, uh, and I can't quite remember the exact quote, but it, it's the, it's where you say, is Lord Sumption the limits in the law? And, and you mm -hmm. actually say um, that, is there any difference between my opinion and my exposition of the law? I have to tell you that there is and it matters. So, so you were aware of the fact then that you might have got yourself from some people thinking that you're already going a little bit far for a serving judge. No, I don't do think so. Um, okay. I, uh, I mean, if I used that as the prelude to a campaign against some uh, principle of, of law, depending on what the principle was, that might be an inappropriate thing for a judge to do. Um, but I mean, all, the only point I was making uh, is that there is a difference between a judge's personal opinion about what the law ought to be uh, and his legal opinion about what the law actually is. I have decided plenty of cases in my judicial career uh, 
uh, which if I were acting as a politician and making the law, uh, I would have decided differently. But that's not my job as a judge. My job as a judge is to decide what the law actually is. Uh, and if, it's, if I reach a conclusion which I don't like, uh, that I'm in, a, in, in, in deciding what the, my conclusion is going to be, the fact that I don't like it may, I suppose, uh, uh, influence that. But if I conclude that the law is X, uh, I am going to say that it's X, even if I personally prefer it to be Y. Okay. Uh, and now you are totally unfettered, unchained, as it were. So, uh, Not um, totally, but almost. Almost, yeah. On that almost thing, in, in, in your Nick Robinson interview, you did come slightly close to saying that you might covertly break the law in, in your closing remarks about what you and your wife might do. Yes, I did. Uh, I mean, as, as I said in answer to a question uh, at the end of my very first Reef lecture, I don't accept that there is a moral obligation to obey the law simply because it is the law. Uh, I think that there are a number of considerations here. I, I think that you, uh, that you owe it to your fellow citizens to um, uh, respect the law uh, in circumstances where there is a common loyalty to the way in which the law was made. Um, and what critically matters is how was the law made? Is it made in a democratically accountable fashion? I have serious criticisms, which I've expressed in the media, about the way in which the various decisions of the government on COVID-19 were made. I don't think that they were made uh, with, with, with any great care. I think that they were made under an extremely loosely drafted statute, the meaning of which is not by any means clear. Um, and so I don't have a great deal of respect for the way in which this particular law was made. But ultimately, everybody is entitled, as it seems to me, morally entitled to say, I am not prepared to obey this law. I recognize that I must take the consequences if I am found out, but I'm not prepared to. Now, the context in which I said that after my wreath lectures was the notorious question of assisted dying. Mm. Uh, and uh, my view was uh, that um, the law ought to remain as it is. In other words, assisted dying should be forbidden. Uh, but there are occasions, quite a lot of occasions in fact, when it is morally acceptable to break the law. Uh, I think that if we didn't have the law, uh, there would be far too many occasions when people took liberties that were not morally justifiable, which is why we should keep it. Yeah. Now, that's a classic dilemma about law and morality. One tries to, uh, uh, to align them, but human affairs being as complicated as they are, one doesn't always succeed. Fair enough. And, and earlier on, I think you were having echoes of Martin Luther King's Birmingham uh, prison letter, weren't you, about, uh, about when, when it is permissible to break an unjust law. Okay, now I promised you that, that we, you know, we, we've done a lot of COVID, but the, the other reason I, <laughs> oh yeah, I want to talk to you about, and we've already gone in slightly into it, but I also do want to talk a little bit about your amazing magnum opus, and there's no question here where, where that uh, you may have achieved some criticisms of the Reef Lectures and, and your views on COVID, but in terms of, of um, history, you, your reviews for now for 25 years have been almost universally um, magnificent, actually, there's no way of putting it, actually. And let us, and, 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 but still with a little bit of the theme of the Black Death, if we go into trial by battle, and so we're starting off the calamitous 14th century, that the, the event of it will be the Black Death. And yet, it doesn't figure that much in your main narrative. I mean, a few main characters are bumped off by it, um, was it Joan, of, Joan of Navarre and people like that. But it doesn't seem to stop the kind of dynastic play of politics, the warfare, and the grand themes that, that you unfold. Why, why, why is that? You would have thought it would have been impossible. Um, well, uh, historically, uh, it is because, it's for two reasons. First of all, as you pointed out earlier in the, uh, this evening, mm -hmm. um, the, um, the, the Black Death was fairly selective. Different phases of it were selective in different mm -hmm. ways. Uh, but it, it, um, 
it didn't attack uh, princes, knights, and so on in the first round. And so um, the, the people who were doing the fighting were not greatly affected. Uh, it enormously affected uh, peasants in particular. Um, it killed a large proportion of them. It did a tremendous amount of good to the survivors because labor became scarce uh, and their wages increased very rapidly. So they were highly satisfied um, uh, with, with the yes. situation. Uh, so it didn't actually very much affect the way the war was fought. Um, the other thing, of course, that one has to point out, going back to earlier arguments, is they didn't put their head in a bag and have a lockdown. They didn't say, <laughs> OK, we'd better stop uh, um, uh, fighting people in France uh, until this uh, uh, terrible epidemic has gone away. Uh, we will uh, ask a, a proto-Professor Ferguson to tell us when that's likely to be, and we'll suspend the war till then. Uh, okay, and 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 also, um, it, it wasn't really a single war, was it? It was a whole series of things. And Dermot McCulloch, re reviewing your latest one, Curse of Kings, says most of the time the two kingdoms' mutual warfare was as ludicrous and ineffective as a couple of elderly drunks fighting in a pub car park. Would it be true to say that, unlike, for example, the well, thirty? That's nonsense, in my view. But never oh, okay, <laughs> tell me why. <laughs> well. Um, the fact is that war and religion uh, have been the two major collective activities of mankind for almost all of mankind's history. Um, and you may say, well, people, most people now probably say that both war and religion are destructive influences. And that's very often true, although not invariably. I don't think that this country would today embark on a war of conquest like the Hundred Years' War, but by the values of the time, it was regarded as a high priority, an important duty that kings owed to their own people and to their own dynasty. Uh, and it seems slightly absurd to say of a generation, well, their problem was that they didn't judge these things in accordance with the values that have come into force uh, <laughs> centuries later. I have always been skeptical about people apologizing for the past uh, because it seems to me to be a fundamentally ahistorical process which is inconsistent with any kind of understanding of humanity. Um, I couldn't agree with you more on that one, actually. You're quite right. And, and to be fair, McCulloch liked the book, by the way, even if you don't Yes, like I know he did. Yes. But I, I, I don't, I mean, of course, one takes liberties in the review, you need to catch the reader's interest, and you sometimes say things that look good until you think seriously about them. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. I do it myself. <laughs> yes, I'm sure you do. You did um, in an earlier review with one of the Penguin Histories. Um, I can't remember, Nira Keen, I think. Nira, uh, anyway. Um, wrote, right, yes. Yes, and, and you talked about the fact that. Uh, um, uh, many people are disappointed by the fact that so many histories of the Hundred Years' War can, uh, it's dominated by butch men fighting, was your quote. Um, oh, there's internet. plenty about women in my history. Yeah, well, I was about to say, there yeah. is also plenty about women, and there's some very yeah. strong characters. Um, yes, certainly. I mean, a it's a very more. odd state of affairs, because until, um, uh, well, really until the 20th century, uh, the only... Uh, important and responsible role that women were eligible to perform was head of state. Um, and that's always been true, even in an age which allowed no role to women in any other context at all. <laughs> yes. There was a time in the middle of the 16th century when uh, almost every major state in Europe was ruled by women. Yep, yep. No, that, that, that's true. But as you say, it was a limited role, but a powerful one. And, well, uh, and Limited in the sense that very few people are heads of state, uh, but uh, okay. <laughs> as, as, as powerful as any state can be. And, and, and one, one last question from that um, that I've been dying to ask you actually on this one is um, and nowadays, I mean, everybody now knows where quarantine, the word comes from, 40, etc., and that it predates the, the Black Death, etc., etc. I don't think they knew that before uh, these last few months, so I think most people do know that now. But what, what, I, what is interesting is um, quite a lot of historians have pointed out that although quarantine was, as I say, accepted as one way of combating whatever they thought the Black Death was, 
the, the English were very slow to adopt it and then don't adopt it until the late 16th century, I think. Do you have any ideas why that might be? What, what, what was it that led us not to do that when other well, places were? Um, I, don't, I don't think the difference between different states is, is, is really quite as great as that. Okay. Um, in the Mediterranean, um, the transmission of diseases was a much more frequent problem than it was in Northern Europe partly because many diseases are sensitive to temperature and partly because the Mediterranean is the point of junction of utterly different civilizations coming from long distances in many directions. Um, so that the Mediterranean countries had a much more developed and practiced way of, of, of dealing with, with this kind of problem than Northern European countries where there really hadn't been much uh, or in the way of really serious epidemic diseases before the 14th century. Okay, now, and uh, so we need to move on a little bit actually. So okay. I want to go, go we, we've, um, there, I mean, your career is so amazing actually. There's, there's, we could be going on for hours here and we're not allowed to, though I would love to. Thank but, you for that. <laughs> yes, well, no, actually, it's a shame. But I want to, I was going to talk a little bit about your time on the Supreme Court, but I, I want mm -hmm. to, I want to skip slightly because um, when um, I watched the, the film of, of your uh, valedic valedictory uh, kind of session, as it were, where, where yeah. the, the nice time when everyone says nice things about you, which is always very pleasant, <laughs> sure. yes, <laughs> whether they mean it or not. But, but, when, but you, you began your response and, and you actually quoted my mother's favorite pianist, Gerald Moore, the great accompanist, who she took me to see once. And um, his autobiography was called, Are You Too Loud? Yes. Uh, and um, which was a sign of how brilliant he was. And I think the implication was one or two people might think you were a little loud. Yes. And I don't think there's any doubt that when you then stepped down from the court, you, you got louder and you gave, of course, your Reef lectures, which have been, uh, I think, would it be fair to say they've had mixed reviews from some quarters? Did, did that well, surprise you? No. Okay. Um, I, uh, um, I, a, a colleague came up to me after one of them and said, you know, I disagree with every word you've just uttered. <laughs> and, I, and I said to him, if you hadn't said that, I would have felt I really hadn't expressed myself clearly enough. Um, I, I know that some of the views that I've expressed are controversial, particularly to lawyers, because the view that I was basically expressing was that law is a limited solution to most of the more serious problems of mankind, and that it should not assume uh, uh, too prominent a place and certainly shouldn't try and displace politics, which is, although very defective in many ways, a better way than law uh, of resolving uh, problems on which people in society disagree, um, or at least some of those problems. Um, that was my theme. Now, if you want to uh, persuade people that law has got too important, you need to choose a better audience than a room full of lawyers. <laughs> and, um, so, of course, I wasn't at all surprised. Uh, there is a, a messianic quality about many lawyers, particularly now, and more so, I think, than there was in previous generations. Human rights lawyers genuinely believe, for example, that human rights are the answer to a very wide range of problems and that forensic proceedings are a better way of deciding almost anything uh, than the political process. I fundamentally disagree with that. I was never going to get agreement from uh, people who thought like that. And of course, they are much more vocal than many of those who agree with me. Uh, but my main object was basically to make people think about something which is a real dilemma. Uh, there is a an inconsistency between democratic principles and legal decision making. And it's simply a dishonest evasion to pretend that the problem just isn't there, to pretend that you can be, that, uh, if you, that liberalism is inherent in democracy and that anything that's illiberal can't be democratic. We have plenty of historical experience to show us uh, that democracies can do terrible things and that judges can do terrible things as well. Um, you know, it is, I wanted to persuade people that they actually have to think about this dilemma and to see how they're going to reconcile them 
and where they can't be reconciled to see what they are going to give priority to. At the moment, uh, at least before my wreath lectures, I think that there was a far too pronounced tendency to say, these aren't problems because democracy and judicial decision making are perfectly consistent. And they are in some circumstances, but not in others. That's the point I wanted to make. So if I have caused people to think seriously about these issues, even if they have reached a different conclusion to myself, I will feel satisfied. Well, I think you, well, you, you certainly achieved that objective without any shadow of doubt. And, and indeed, there was a, a great deal of agreement as well for, yes. for the points we're making. And we should also be clear that you, some people have grossly misinterpreted, because you're talking about the, particularly about the European Convention on Human Rights and the European uh, Court in Strasbourg. Let's first of all be absolutely clear, this is nothing at all to do with the European Union or Brexit. Nothing at all. Nothing, but a lot of people thought that it was. And, and yeah, it needs to no, be it's made not. Clear. Yeah. We're out of the Union, but we're not out of the Convention on yes, Human Rights. Yes, absolutely. And, and equally, you defend the original purposes of, of the European Convention and in, in perfectly reasonable ways, but you, you do have an issue with the way in which its process works. I think that's a fair Comment, yes, I have an issue with what you can loosely call mission creep. Yes, uh, which is a tendency having identified certain fundamental principles like those set out in the original um, convention, a tendency to expand them by a process of extrapolation to neighboring areas. And it's, it's something that lawyers are very much inclined to do. They, they fall in love with a legal way of doing things and they apply it to areas which are actually uh, matters of non-legal judgment. Um, but the, the, the audience the, today... The, the Strasbourg Court is, is a famously responsible for that. <laughs> and, and, and of course, it has, there is no appeal, you would, you would you, you Absolutely argue. not. Yeah. But you use a case that this audience will be very familiar with. And I just wanted, in, in the read lectures, you touch on the Charlie Gard case. Yes. And I think most of the audience here will know what that is. Um, I wasn't criticising that. You, well, you weren't. No, I wasn't. I, I, it's, it, I mean, maybe I didn't express myself carefully enough, um, but I think I did, in fact. Um, you, you felt I, that, I think you said that the, that the parents were making a, a, a choice which was well within the choices that parents should be able to make. I think no, was, I didn't put it like that. What I was okay. saying... I mean, this was in my first lecture when mm. I was trying to explain how it has come about that people expect very much more of the state and therefore confer on the state much greater powers than they used to. The point that I was making about Charlie Gerd is that this was a case in which the courts intervened to say what ought to happen in circumstances where 50 perhaps more than 50 years before, they would have regarded it as part of the enclosed domain of the family. Now, that is a development which has occurred in very, very many fields. I was simply pointing out uh, that people now look to the state to do things which were regarded as a matter for uh, social convention and family before. I wasn't criticizing the decision, and I don't criticize it. No, you don't, but, but you, I think that's not quite fair in a way because it goes against your, your other argument because what was happening there was a completely, as I understand it, a completely normal piece of judicial reasoning brought about by Parliament and the Children's Act, yes. which makes it absolutely clear that the wishes of the child is paramount and there is a dispute about that. And that's what yes. judges are put on earth to deal with, well, that's isn't it? That, and that's why I wasn't criticising that. <laughs> okay. All right, but, but it, it's an example. I was simply pointing out that this is, it's by, by statute, not just judicial decision. Yes. As you say, the Children Act is the decisive thing. Now, and, all I was saying was that this is an example of the way in which um, the law, whether statutory or judicially made, has tended to take over areas of decision making which were previously uh, decisions of other groups decisions of, of families, for example, in that instance, but there are okay. other examples where the decision-making would have been of some other body. 
I, I need to read this again. Obviously, I told you I would get wounded in, in action here, and, uh, and that's obviously what's happening. Well, I mean, you're, I will say this. The view that you expressed about my opinion on Charlie Gard was one which a lot of people felt at the time, and it's one reason why, when I came to write up the lectures uh, for publication in book form, uh, I thought, perhaps wrongly, that I had made it absolutely clear that I wasn't criticizing the decision and, and what I was using it for. Okay, and, 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 and you now have made that absolutely clear. Um, but it's, I'm still not sure it was the, the, the it, wasn't, it wasn't the general point that you were making on, on the law. And, and, and obviously, yes, some people didn't like what you said. There's uh, you know, eminent and, and indeed... Lady if some Ailes. people hadn't liked what I've said, it would hardly have been worth delivering the lectures <laughs> at all. No, that, that's, yes, that's right. That reminds me of the famous dictum of, of news, isn't it? That... Uh, the only news worth printing is where someone disagrees with it. All the rest is advertising. <laughs> well, <laughs> I hadn't heard that, but it sounds yes, right. Yes, I, I think it's Hearst. I'm, I think it's William Randolph. I think so. I'm, I'm not sure, but it's certainly one of the great, the great magnates. But, but in in but but again, in, in your argument of, of what I think some people sometimes you, you, you're against judicial activism, uh, or however we're going to express it. Um, again. Uh, Certainly a lot of the judges I know, and we've both been on the Judge Judicial Appointments Committee, so we've, well, you know, thousands, I know a few. I, I generally find that when I talk to them, they, they agree with you on that. They agree that, that um, you know, that they just, that, but they, they're not sure that, that the examples you use prove the point of judicial activism. And I think that's, that's the, they don't dis dispute, they don't dispute that that would be a bad thing. And, and Lady Hell specifically said, look, you know, we, Judges can't overturn Parliament. Parliament can overturn judges. So yes, well, all of that is true. And one factor which I've noticed among my colleagues is that the most judicial activist colleagues that I've got always deny that they're being activists. They always <laughs> say, uh, "Look, I'm only complying with the law." Um, the fact is that the, the law uh, that they are complying with is the law as they have held it to be. Uh, and different judges have different propensities when it comes to deciding what the law is. I mean, I think most people would regard Brenda Hale as um, a, a very activist judge. Uh, but my, I think that many judges protest too much. Uh, the most activist judges are the ones who claim to be most conservative. I'm not an activist judge, uh, and I'm accused of saying all sorts of very radical things. <laughs> and long may you do so. Okay, we're coming towards the end, but can I, can I ask you then just to look back a little bit? Um, I can't remember where, who was it who said, I think it might have been, it might have been you or someone, that, but when, um, when you left um, academia, but not history, um, who was it who's, who, it was Lord Denning, wasn't it, who said that you were making a big mistake to uh, yes. go to the bar. I had disagreed with him about something which he'd said in a recent headline. That's oh, why he well. thought I was making a mistake. <laughs> Do you think you did? I can't remember what I disagreed with him about now, so I can't answer that question. But do, do you think that, I mean, there are so many different- Oh, no, I, I, I don't think it was a mistake to go no, to the bar. No, that's what I meant. No, yeah. no, no. The law, uh, it's, I mean, I think that you need a hinterland. You need to have a few other interests because you're not likely to be a very good lawyer if you're only interested in law. Um, but law is an interesting social science. Uh, mm. The whole process of legal dialectic is a fascinating process. And frankly, I wouldn't have missed it for anything. And, and I think also um, it, it's actually illegal to become an amateur judge, isn't it? But you can still keep up an amazing hist interest and, and, and expertise in history without breaking any laws at all. I think you'd have been so. bored. I've been doing it. <laughs> I think you would have been. But um, okay, so um, and lots of questions come in. We've not been able to go over your views on Miller One and Miller Two and all of these things, I'm afraid, and uh, your favorite cases, etc. But I, I suppose I, I can just ask you finally, though, you know, what, well, one, one of the, uh, one quirky question has come in from one of your colleagues that uh, maybe we'll finish slightly with that one, though. You have an excellent collection yourself of, of, uh, manuscripts as, as you would imagine you would. Um, if there's a fire, which one of your manuscripts would you most save? 
by manuscripts. You mean of my own works? No, I think I, you. I did. don't have any manuscripts. So the ah, answer I is thought it, you did. Oh, no, no, I've got I've got lots of books. You can see some of them behind me. Yes, I can um, see that. Now, someone seems to think you have also a reasonable collection of medieval manuscripts yourself. No, I don't. You Not don't, a single no. one. Oh, <laughs> right. Well, there you are. They're bloody lawyers, honestly. They, they tell you all these untruths. I know. I should never believe them. Okay. Well, let's I say know where you got it from, and it was a very unreliable source. Clearly, clearly. Well, let's say you're in Humphrey of Gloucester's library then, okay? One of the great, mm -hmm. you know, the, one of the great pieces of civilization of the 14th century. It wasn't all calamitous. Which manuscript would you save there? Huh. Well, uh, he owned some manuscripts which uh, recorded the life of his great hero, who was his elder brother, Henry V. It would be a pity to lose those. It would be one of those, that one. I think so, but that's okay. a peculiarly personal choice. That's exactly what we wanted. Okay, so, so so I think then, I, I think that that is probably where, where, where we will end then on, on this thing of Henry V. We could have then talked about the mythology of Henry V and what you've written there. And I think the only thing we can do is get you back at another time or indeed to come and actually when we have a time when we can have you talk in person and do what we always do with, well, with our conversation guests, take you for dinner. And, uh, and let's hope that time comes as soon as it possibly can. Yes, I feel cheated without the dinner. Yes, you do. So... So I want to, I, I, so I want to first, I just need to make a, don't, don't go just for one second. No, I'm not going to say that, um, first of all, to remind everybody that um, this, this series is promoted by the Royal Society of Medicine as part of what we do. And um, we, we, we don't charge you for, for listening and being hopefully entertained, as I'm sure you have, um, by our speakers and in particular Lord Sumption this evening. But do please think about giving a donation to the society. These are hard times for all of us. Uh, in this kind of business across the whole world. Now, tomorrow, um, I remain in the hot seat as we go back to our lunchtime series of um, webinars. It's totally concerned with COVID, and uh, it's time to talk to the one and only Don Berwick, one of the most respected commentators in both the US and the UK healthcare systems, and how they have reacted to the challenges of COVID. And, and he's um, almost as well known as Lord Sumption, um, and again, is incapable, like both of you, of being dull. And then next Wednesday, um, back in this series, we'll have a journey down memory lane as our president-elect. Uh, we'll debate the more recent past in the Battle of Crecy with Norman Lamont, and no doubt with the sounds of Edith Piaf very much in our minds. So back to you then, Lord Sumption. Thank you so much for this. As I expected, uh, beginning with my analogy of attacking the machine gun position, I've ended up partly hanging on the old barbed wire as I expected. Uh, but nevertheless, it has been an entirely enjoyable experience for me, and I'm quite certain a captivating one for our audience. And I can just thank you so much for giving of your time, and I really hope we will see and hear much more of you. Thank you so much. <laughs>